Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Bernard de Koenig. I'm the chair of the Department of Applied Mathematics, uh, which is uh, hosting this event. Um, thank you all for coming. It's, it's fantastic to see such a great interest in, in science education. I also want to thank the uh, biology department, which uh, has helped out a lot, especially Mary Pat, uh, with the uh, logistics for this event. The talk you are about to attend is one of nine Boeing uh, colloquia that the department organizes every academic year. So let me tell you a little bit about that colloquium series. So uh, in part supported by an endowment from uh, Boeing, the department brings uh, each academic year nine very high profile speakers to the campus. Um, you know, these people are at the top of their field in a large variety of areas, all relevant to applied mathematics. Um, and they are also uh, always great communicators. They usually end up talking in front of audiences of 100 to 200 people. This is a larger crowd. Um, but the topics, uh, you know, have varied a lot, you know, from robotics, finance, neuroscience, uh, infectious diseases, tsunami modeling, and today education. Um, we definitely hope that today is not going to be the last Boeing talk uh, you'll attend. Uh, for instance, two weeks from now, uh, we have another Boeing talk uh, by uh, Alan Perlson from Los Alamos uh, National Lab and the Santa Fe Institute. And uh, Dr. Perlson has made great progress uh, helping our understanding of the HIV virus, for instance. So that's going to be two weeks from now. But let me tell you about today's speaker. Uh, Professor Carl Wyman uh, is originally from the Pacific Northwest. He uh, grew up in uh, Corvallis, Oregon. Uh, and after being an undergraduate at MIT, he got his PhD from Stanford uh, in 1977. He went to Michigan for a number of years, uh, and then he went to the University of Colorado, Boulder, for a faculty position, uh, and he continued his, uh, his work on atomic physics and, and optical physics. And this work then eventually led to the experiments for which he uh, was awarded the Nobel uh, Prize in Physics, uh, on fundamental contributions to uh, Bose-Einstein condensates. This was shared with uh, Eric Cornell and Wolfgang Ketterle. And uh, so just a few sentences. Bose-Einstein condensates are a new form of matter. It was uh, predicted by Einstein, uh, or actually first by Bose in 1924, 1925. Um, and I should say, so on a personal note, I was at the University of Colorado uh, during this time. I was a few buildings over. I was in applied math. Uh, but um, it was um, it spread uh, it spread across campus like wildfire when these experiments were first successful in creating this new uh, uh, this new form of matter. Uh, so this was really very exciting. But that's not uh, what you're going to hear about today. Um, today uh, you're going to hear about uh, teaching and education. So uh, since then, Professor Wyman has gotten. Uh, more and more interested in, uh, in science education and how we can improve how effective it is. Um, and he has, um, he has uh, headed, um, he has led education initiatives uh, at both University of Colorado in Boulder and at University of British Columbia where he was until 2013 uh, before moving back to Stanford where he's now a professor in uh, both the physics and the education departments. Um, Dr. Wyman's awards are too many to list. Um, I've already mentioned the Nobel Prize. The Nobel Prize was awarded in, in 2001, which is only four years after the experiments that led to it uh, were done, which is really an, incredible, an incredibly short period for a Nobel Prize. Um, and, um, so among many other awards, he is a member of the National Academy of Sciences, and he was the founding chair for its board on science education. In uh, 2004, he was United States Professor of the Year. And uh, with that, please join me in welcoming Professor Carl Wyman. OK, well, it's, it's a pleasure to be back. And is this working now? Pleasure to be back in Seattle. Does that work? That's eh, still on. They're, they're having trouble with it. Doesn't seem. Can you come down and turn up the volume or something? About as close as I can get it. Um, testing one two. 
Can you hear me yet? Still? Hmm. Battery working? Sorry, I thought this was all tested. Okay, I'll just, okay. Great. Well, it's nice to be back in Seattle and an un, from my experience, a rather unusual day. Even if the, <laughs> comfort yourself that if, even if the talk, you don't get much out of the talk, you'll re reduce your risk of skin cancer. So, uh, so I, I have to start with a slight correction to the introduction. Uh, it's typical, people talk about, I got the Bobo Nobel Prize, and then I start working in education. I actually started, as I'll explain in a minute, started working in education a long time earlier, but it's just nobody paid attention to me until I got the Nobel Prize. So the work that I'm really going to talk about today, I mean, a little bit comes from my own science education research group, but I'm really representing a very large body of research done by many people, including um, a number of, a uh, couple of prominent groups here at University of Washington. So, okay, so how did I get involved in this? It actually came through my uh, atomic physics research and seeing a, a pattern that I was very struck by. I worked very closely with graduate students. These are small scale experiments. Um, and I saw that these students would come into my research lab after, you know, many years of great success in physics courses, but they really couldn't do physics, um, you know, in, in spite of that. But after just a couple of years working in the lab, they had turned into expert physicists. And, you know, at first you think, you see this, you think it's just something about a student. But after I saw it happening consistently, um, I decided there was some basic question here. And so this was almost 30 years ago now, and I decided to treat this like a, you know, like a science question and dig into what we knew about how people learned, how they learned to become more like experts, and particularly how people learn physics. And in fact, at that time, uh, it was particularly useful to look at the work from the physics education research group at Washington here, which really pioneered that kind of study of teaching and learning physics. So out of this, I found that, okay, this made complete sense. There actually wasn't a puzzle there. And it got me started doing this kind of uh, physics and then broadly science education research. And, you know, I was excited because it was really very much like sort of pushing forefront physics. You had, you could do controlled experiments, you get data, you find guiding principles that actually reproduce. Uh, so it, uh, and that's really, why I ended up having these, for decades, these two parallel research groups, one blasting atoms with lasers and the other, you know, testing how students were learning and, and thinking. So what is all that background noise? Is there a door open somewhere that you could close? Um, sorry, I don't know if it bothers you, but it distracts me. So. <laughs> um, so this is actually a very uh, kind of pivotal time, I think, in, in university education because over the past few decades, there's been major advances in three different fields which are now coming together in a very nice, consistent way to give us much clearer understanding about how learning and teaching of complex thinking, where the complex thinking uh, I mean is, you know, thinking like a scientist or an engineer. And it comes, the, the different fields are the, the, uh, let's see if this works. Oh, well, it doesn't matter. Um, the, uh, the cognitive psychologist who study at a sort of basic level using labs, you know, basic thinking and, and learning of people. Most, very recently, brain research, uh, and then the kind of work that I do and people here do in, uh, in actually the science and engineering classrooms. Now, I'll just say quickly in passing, the, the basic, uh, you know, these things here, thanks, um, these things here are actually quite general beyond science and, and engineering. And so I'm pretty confident all the things I ta are talking about will eventually be shown to work the same way in many other fields. It's just people haven't carried out these kind of classroom studies yet to demonstrate them. So um, 
In any case, uh, before I launch into detail, I think that, you know, folks in the audience at the university need to recognize that there's some pretty clear signs that there's really going to have to be change in how teaching uh, is done at universities. And there's the clear sign I uh, have seen from that is really looking at the AAU. The, that's the American Association of Universities. It's the 62 most prominent research universities in the country, of which UW is one of them. And uh, before 2011, they had their meetings, you know, their presidents, they had never discussed teaching and learning. You know, it was all about finances and football teams and organizing medical schools. And, and so that was the first time they'd ever addressed this subject. And now, uh, just six years later, there's a letter sent out by the president of this organization to the members, and it starts saying, okay, we're committed to excellent teaching, et cetera. And then it ends with this statement, which I'll just let you read. So any, anyway, those of you who know anything about these kind of organizations know this is just unheard of, and it's a really, you know, really strong statement that they could be taking, uh, and, and it's driven really by very strong evidence. And my talk is really to give you the justification of that claim, but before I do, I, I want to sort of start with the educational goal that we and Mary Sue Goldman are, are thinking about here, and it's really... Uh, it's having students uh, from our classes really learning to think about and make decisions, really, in relevant contexts, like an expert, i.e. faculty member, uh, in that discipline. So faced with a relevant sort of thing, they, they would understand what evidence is, how to make, you know, and how to use that to actually make decisions. And I, I would argue that that's ultimately the most important thing uh, that we want to have them learn. And that's what my research particularly focuses on. And so the first part of my talk will be really what is this, you know, thinking like an expert in, in the discipline, particularly in science and engineering, and how is it learned? And that's the cognitive psychology part of the talk. And I want to emphasize one thing that comes out very clearly is that curriculum, which frankly is what most of the discussions at universities are about, you know, do we teach them A, then B, or, or the other order, and do we include C? Um, that's really just tells you the information the students are exposed to. If you if you want to look at what the thinking that they actually learn and really is useful much longer after the topics have become obsolete, those are overwhelmingly determined by the teaching methods, not actually the curriculum. Um, OK, so then I'll, I'll move on to, to this, to, to, to looking at applying these uh, in the classrooms and seeing what kind of results you have. And then I'm going to finish up a little bit on institutional change, uh, how universities like UW can make uh, the, this more effective teaching more widespread, and a little bit something everybody can take home tomorrow to use. So cognitive psychologists have done a lot of research on what makes up expert thinking across all of these different fields. And remarkably, they find this is a very high level of consistency about the, the, the thinking of an expert. And the, there's sort of three basic components you see showing up all the time. Well, the first one, everybody could guess. Any expert has a lot of knowledge about their particular discipline. But the others aren't nearly so obvious. Um, the second is that in every discipline, there's unique to that discipline a particular way all that knowledge is organized and linked together. And this makes them uh, an expert then so that when they have working on a problem, they can be very efficient and effective at retrieving and applying the information they need out of this vast uh, body. And uh, so, you know, what goes into these expert organization systems, okay, I, you know, it takes a while to look at details, but the, you know, the basic uh, things are a set of 
particular models and, and the idea of scientific concepts, you know, a scientific concept is actually, if you think about it, really just the way scientists in a field took a, a lot of different pieces of information and saw how they could lump them all together in, in one label and so when faced with a problem could very quickly decide whether that whole body of information is relevant or not relevant in actually solving problems. Um, the third general aspect is the ability to monitor one's own thinking and learning when working in the field. And so, for example, if I'm working on a problem in physics, I, you know, I can stop in the middle and sort of ask myself, you know, does this look like this is making progress or, gee, maybe I should stop and try a different direction. That's something experts routinely do in their uh, problem solving as well. So what, what this research shows is these are fundamentally new ways of thinking. Nobody's born with them. Everyone requires many hours of actually intense practice to develop them. And bad news for students, if, you're, if you want to get to sort of, you know, a UW faculty level uh, of expertise, it's actually consistently many thousands of hours of this intense practice. Now, it's very recently becoming uh, pretty clear that this is a basic biological requirement, actually. Um, and it's the, the fact is we can see that as a result of this kind of intense practice, the brain is really substantially rewired. And it's really within this rewired brain that the, that the expertise and mastery actually lies. And so what as a quite recent understanding is that this is very much like sort of building up a muscle. If I want to make this muscle, you know, better, bigger and stronger, I have to use that muscle. I've got to use it very intensely. I can't just use it easily a lot. Um, and I've got to do that over a long period of time. And in response, my body says, okay, it's going to keep using. I got to make it bigger and stronger. And it, so it does very much the, the same thing with the brain, with all the same requirements of, of intense, uh, you know, extended use. And it's got to be exercising it in just the right way. And so that's the other part of the of this research is they find consistently across all these fields, this development of expertise involves the same basic process. It's got to be doing these hard, you know, working, the brain is working through these hard tasks or questions, but it's not enough just to just, and they've got it, uh, there's a couple of con other conditions though. First, they've got to be practicing the very specific thinking skills. You want the brain to learn so that it's hooking up the wiring to do that. Um, but then also there's got to be feedback um, on, you know, to the learner and what they're doing right, and more importantly, what they're doing wrong and how they can improve. And this is the basic process then of iterating on this, doing more and more practice and feedback, getting increasingly better and better and better, and that establishes these high levels of expertise. Now, that's very general. I want to talk a little more about, okay, so what are the, some of the thinking skills that you want the you know, the learner to be practicing and getting feedback on. And if you look carefully at these, they really boil down always to making decisions. And so I'm putting them in this frame of a bunch that I know are quite generic across fields of science and engineering. And at first, you know, when faced with some new problem, new situation uh, to solve, being able to decide first, you know, which concepts are going to be relevant there and what's not relevant uh, and what close to that is then what information is needed to solve this problem and, and what can you ignore. Um, decide what simplifications or approximations are appropriate as gu usually guided by those concepts. Um, and based on that then coming up with a set of potential solutions that you then carry forward thinking about what information you need to decide between them and, and advance them and so on. Um, and somewhere fairly early in this process, in, a, in virtually every field, there's specialized representations of processes and information which the experts in that field use to then guide sort of their insights and development of ideas. So uh, then there's a bunch more. You kind of work through solutions here. Uh, and then when you get to, a, to an answer, every field has 
field-dependent criteria by which you check if this makes sense, you know, uh, and is a, is a reasonable conclusion. So these are the sort of things that the learner making these kind of decisions, he, he wants someone to become an expert, they've got to be practicing very explicitly that, those kind of decision processes. Now, you know, these, I didn't say anything about content there, and of course, like I said before, most of the discussions in a bit, University education is about topics, but there's lots of research showing that, um, you know, people can learn a lot of information and topics and be utterly incapable of doing anything with it useful because these are the kind of skills that really tell a person when and how to use that information in, in meaningful ways. Okay, so. That's the basic idea of how to turn people into thinking more like experts uh, in a field. So, but how do you actually do this in a classroom? Okay, so this kind of practicing expert thinking with good feedback. And so I'll, I want to just give you some examples. This is the kind of things that physics education researchers and, and, well, and biology and others have been studying. And I'm going to take the one that I think for most people it seems the hardest environment to do, which would be in a classroom like this. And so um, I'll take, you know, put myself and how I actually do this in teaching, you know, in first year students about basic ideas of electricity. So first I start with a, give them a, a short pre-class reading assignment. Now, I don't expect them to learn the physics from this, but what I can, what I do expect is basic information and terminology that can be done much, just as well or better from them reading about rather than me wasting valuable class time, to, you know, being a talking textbook. So we have them read it, give a little online quiz, check they did it, reward them. And then that frees up class time to start with asking them questions. And so, for example, I would give them uh, this question with light bulbs and, and batteries here. I see them, okay, close this switch. What's going to happen to the brightness of that bulb? And since it's a big class, I want to make sure everybody's involved. I'm going to use some technology. Probably everybody, hopefully everybody here knows what a clicker is. Little device that looks about like this with a bunch of series of buttons on it. You can do the same with cell phones now. But what I have here is they have to answer. And so the, my computer records who they were and what answer they chose. Now, it, largely because I've seen such terrible use of clickers in Stanford. <laughs> so I, I want to say a little digression to talk a little more about what clickers can and can't do for you, okay? So as an instructor, I can see my display up here, you know, right away if everybody knows, the, has the right answer or everybody gets this wrong. So it gives me some broader feedback of, from the whole class than I can get in other ways. But for, uh, probably more importantly is what it does for the, the learner. Because what this means is that um, by, you know, having to make an answer like that, all of these students have to commit to some, an answer in which they are at some level accountable, okay? Even if at a very low level. And basic psychology says when that happens, they stop and they think about it much more intently than they would if I just threw out this question to the class and asked them what the answer was. And I could prove this to you by, by having, making everybody in, the, in here write down what answer they thought. And then, I, and then I'd add, oh, and put your name on it and drop that paper off as you're walking out. And I would see you paying a whole lot more attention to what you wrote down, okay? Um, so what that means is that just means that they've thought about it and they're much more primed for learning subsequently. And so then they, I don't show them what the vote was or the answer, then they have to talk to each adjacent students here about the reasons and, and re-vote. And a lot of times instructors, when they're uh, sort of new to this, and I'll again point to Stanford for that failure mode to not embarrass people here, uh, they think that what's happening here is just, oh, the stronger student and no more are just explaining things to the weaker students and that's all that's happening. Um, and in fact, no, it's a, it's a much more um, 
It's a different and, and much more important process than that. It turns out, and there's lots of studies of this, that when you're thinking about teaching someone and or examining someone's teaching that you're not sure if they're right, this kicks in a quite different cognitive process uh, in your brain that actually produces substantially greater different and greater learning than if you're just thinking about it as on, on your own here. Okay, so, but in addition, a great value of this is I wouldn't be standing up here while they're talking about that. I'd be going up and down the aisles listening in on those conversations. I'm getting little snapshots of what's thinking going on in those students' brains. Um, you know, what's like a physicist and what isn't, and so that I'm enormously more informed about the thinking process. And just if you haven't done this, I'll just tell you, you might think everybody's different. Now nah, I can go up and down the aisles and catch 80 or 90 percent of the thinking of everybody in the class. There's just not that much variation on these topics. So, so then I go ahead and I demonstrate, you know, what the results were and show them, show them that. And then, very importantly, then there's a follow-up summary that I would lead by the instructor, where I'd bring out what reasoning and models uh, the students had about this, which was correct. And then I emphasize another uh, very common mistake is very often they'll say, oh, you know, a bunch of you missed it. Here's the right way to think about it. What I learned from my cognitive psychologist friends is that does not produce very much learning, okay? The learning really takes place when people understand that they were incorrect and then why they were incorrect and so how they can change and moving forward in the future. That's, uh, and so really that's the critical thing to focus on. That's what produces learning. Now you're teaching this way, then it generates vastly more student questions and in a typical lecture and you can explore the, the ideas in a more broader and deeper way. Okay, so back to the original point though. How are the students thinking like physicists in this problem? Well, they're faced with a new situation. They've got to think about what their concept of electric electricity is and how it goes to lighting up light bulbs, deciding what's relevant, what's irrelevant in that situation for making sense of it. Um, and then they've got to apply and, and test those uh, this concepts both in convincing other people and critiquing uh, you know their neighbors' uh, arguments about about this. And so you know if you just kind of looked across the the, the row here, you know any physicists in the audience will kind of sit back and say, oh yeah, that's what I spend my time doing all day long. To a, you know when I'm not building equipment, sort of. That's you know this is what. You know, what physics and more generally these things in science, it, it's really capturing the essence of it. Now, but while they're doing that, they're also getting f feedback to improve their thinking. Uh, and they're getting it from other students in the discussions there. They're getting it from comparing their prediction to what actually happens in the demonstration. And most critically, they're getting it from me now, the highly informed instructor about to, to give them much more targeted helpful feedback to, to improve their thinking. So that's how to make this work basically in a great big classroom. So just uh, you know summarizing lots of, of research here, I've really been focusing on this practicing the decision making with good feedback. That's what if people do that they learn, if they don't do that they don't learn. But there's actually a lot of other factors that come in to making any given activity here work well. And so, and I'm not going to take time to go into details, but these are really enablers that you really have to pay attention to. It's the sort of thing that uh, discipline-based education researchers are, you know, study and, and optimize. There's, you know, it's got to address their prior knowledge and beliefs. It's got to uh, deal with motivation. Those areas, there's a lot of, that's where a lot of the diversity in the student population comes in. It's got to pay attention to the basic cognitive limitations that the brain can, that can hear and process information. And it's got to bring in the disciplinary expertise of the science that goes into, you know, deciding what are the expert, how do experts make decisions, what are those decisions, and giving good feedback on them. And so it really means that you have to have 
to, to do this properly, you have to have important expertise in the discipline and this, uh, what I would argue is quite, on historical terms, quite recently developed real expertise in the teaching of it to find that there are basic principles and techniques that just work a lot better than others uh, and well tested by uh, empirically. And this is really, uh, you know, I'll put a plug in because there's a bunch of work in, in discipline-based education research, the department's really figuring out how to do this and testing it. Uh, you know, they really have, that's really provides the guidance of, to the normal fact, regular faculty as to how to optimize these processes. So, okay, so that's the general principles. How does it work in the classroom? Um, well, so there's been, you know, a thousand plus studies comparing the, the traditional and still pervasive lecture uh, in science and engineering with these kind of research-based methods. And uh, the Scott Freeman and co collaborators from here or elsewhere have done the best overall meta-analysis of all this. Uh, but basically these studies consistently show this research-based approach uh, achieves better learning and the, the differences are, are the largest the more you focus on, on learning really very directly to think about, make decisions like experts in the relevant situation. Um, lower failure rates, and they, they benefit all students, but there's somewhat, usually somewhat greater benefit for the most at risk. So I'm gonna run through a few of my favorite examples of this, um, starting with this uh, study at Cal Poly, where I like it because they had a whole bunch of different, they have small sections, a whole bunch of different instructors. They're looking at the first year mechanics, which every place, uh, you know, kind of the key, uh, concepts in that are force and motion, and, the, and with physics education research have some good tests for how well students are learning to think like a physicist to make predictions when seen, when exposed to simple real world uh, situations they haven't seen before, certain kinds of cars running into trucks, etc. So they collected data on all the instructors over a number of years, and by this particular test scored about 0.3, which is typical for a well-taught lecture course. We have data from many places on this. And then they switch to, I'll just label it as my, you know, expert practice and feedback. In this case, there's small sections, not a giant class. So they have students working in small groups around tables and the instructors walking around, you know, acting as a coach on this. Uh, but basically, all the sections, the learning, dramatically increases, so the average is now about a, is a factor of two higher than it was when these people were giving lectures. So I want to just emphasize a, 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 the point that's really, that comes out of this whole body of research we have, shows up over and over again. Um, and certainly at the university level, it's really, you know, what determines in a good instructor or a bad instructor is what teaching methods they use. And so, you know, these are the same instructors, but by using different teaching methods, they're producing much more learning. And, I mean, in some cases, it's really kind of extraordinary. This, whoever this person is, that's a factor of six improvement from what their students learned in their course. Um, this is from computer science, uh, UC San Diego. They took their four core introductory computer science courses. Beth Simon came and worked with me for a year, learned to take the, the approach just like I demonstrated in the electricity example, and then they went back and applied it in these computer science courses. And they looked at the drop and failure rates there, and basically they went down dramatically across the board, and so, they again, same instructors, simply by learning more effective ways of teaching, they have a th about a third the failure rate they did before. So, you know, this is a big impact on the student population there who wants to study computer science. Um, those studies and most of the research in this look at the learning over an entire course. This is one particular experiment uh, that we did where uh, we want to look at just the learning that takes place just in the class, partly because 
uh, that's the place where most faculty spend their time thinking and worrying about what's happening. Um, but also we want to test the idea that people automatically assume if you're teaching this way you can't cover nearly as much material. So we wanted to also make a test of that, uh, height of that question. So we got a giant introductory physics course all the engineering students had to take, two section, two large sections of it which had a whole bunch of tests showing they're virtually identical uh, in all respects. And then one of those sections was then taught by a very experienced professor with high student, you know, evaluations. And the other one was taught by somebody who was trained by, in my program, on these research-based teaching methods. And the two agreed to cover the same content, same set of lecture, uh, you know, learning objectives in exactly the same amount of class time, one week of classes, which were carefully timed so they wouldn't be doing homework or studying for exams during that period. And then they developed an exam targeting that material that was given as a pop quiz right at the start of the following class. So it was really just capturing, okay, what did they take away from those classes and uh, from the classroom in terms of learning. And so the experimental class design, it was just what I already uh, talked to you about. The only, you know, pre-class readings, the uh, respond with clickers, some of these were more quantitative, so the students would work on worksheets writing equations and things down, but basic, same basic idea. And I, I do want to emphasize that it's not like these classes are completely turned over to the students. In this class, and in I would argue almost all of these well-taught classes, the instructor's still talking for roughly half the time, but it's not, it's not, uh, you know, sort of up front. It's always in feedback, and after the students have been prepared, been prepared to learn from that expert telling and feedback that uh, it, they're talking. Okay, so how do they compare and the results? Well, you know, here's a histogram of the score, test score versus the number of students here. And you can see there's a big difference between the two classes. Now, actually, there's probably a bigger difference than you realize, because this was a fairly carefully developed multiple choice exam. And so on average, just random guessing would give three. And so basically, the amount of learning, you really should think about how far above three they're actually scoring, okay? So if you look at it that way, boy, there is not a whole lot of learning going on in these classes, and there's a profound difference between the two approaches. Now, you might, and certainly this instructor was really shocked that they could be so low. Personally, when I got into this field a long time ago, I started doing some studies about what my own students were learning when they walked out of my, you know, brilliantly clear lectures, and I, so this wasn't so surprising to me. Anyway, I, I want to stress a couple of other points here, though, which is that a lot of times when people talk about this kind of learning, the faculty who went, you know, they'll say, oh, well, that might be all right for the weaker students, but strong students like I was in class, you know, they can learn just fine from lectures. And what this data and lots of other research can by other people show is no, this, you know, the entire distribution moves up, you know. This only works for the students who have a human brain, because that's the way the human brain learns, and boy, a pretty big fraction of our students usually do, okay. Um, now, in this study, we also measured engagement. And uh, not surprising, these are the much higher engagement here, because the students are apt to a answer questions, discuss with you, argue with each other, and so on. Um, but I want to stress that just because I think this is an increasingly import, uh, you know, important issue in, in really the classroom at any level, but particularly in college, where Students have now so many additional things <laughs> to distract them. And one of the most clearest results from learning science is as soon as the brain is splitting its attention between two things, learning just goes to hell. You can, so if, you're, if you have a student who's looking at their, you know, their cell phone, their computer, forget it. They didn't learn anything in class that day, okay? And so, so you know, yeah, it was really good what they were doing here, but just having them pay attention to anything is, is already has a big, big impact. Um, okay, so one of the things, 
uh, there's lots and lots of studies that show big improvements in averages this way. But I and you know my group and others are worrying about, okay, yeah, moving this up is fine, but we want to move all those up there too. And so that involves understanding the different subgroups, why and how they're learning differently. And so I want to just, and, and this is work I know being done here at UW, particularly in biology. Uh, and so I want to show you the uh, uh, one experiment that I collaborated on with uh, folks at Cornell. And this is looking at their big introductory biology class. And they had noted, you know, it had been taught the standard lecture approach uh, for a number of years. And they had this uh, unfortunate gap between the underrepresented minority students, mostly African American, and the majority students is sort of pervasive. So then they switch to this, well, they label it as active learning. It's, uh, you know, this is the practice and feedback and, and group discussion. And basically, the, the URM students improved, and so that gap has just gone away. Now, but we wanted to dig into this more as researchers and understand not just that it worked, but more about why it worked. And so uh, the folks at Cornell collected a lot of other data about attitudes and, and views and things from the students. And uh, so then my student, Shima, who's a whiz with these really complicated statistic analysis kind of things, did a, a mediation analysis. And basically, what she showed is that the, the student self-efficacy, their belief that they could be successful in biology, that went up uh, between these two kinds of instructions, went up for everybody substantially in the active learning class. But only for the URM students did that increase in self-efficacy translate to an increase in performance and in fact was the do, was the dominant impact on on why they improved so oops so I mean this is really interesting as research because this is quite different from sort of the cognitive things I was talking about before and just is saying no this kind of teaching here, or certainly for this population, has these other kind of social psychological impacts that can also uh, make a difference to students. Okay, uh, moving along, uh, okay, the other argument we often get is, okay, this is fine for introductory courses, but more advanced courses, you know, they're fine to just do by lectures. So one of the things that, that my group and others have been doing uh, in recent years is testing that applying, you can't apply the same, uh, exact, the same kind of, of implementation activities, but you can apply the same basic principles uh, in more advanced classes, and we've been looking at how doing that. And usually the way that's done is that, you know, these are smaller classes. Students are working through worksheets, you know, these are very mathematical, kind of going through that have them practicing thinking and, and calculating like experts in physics do, uh, working together with then the instructors circulating around here, and a, and a rather carefully orchestrated uh, activity set. So anyway, does it work? Yes, obviously, because I'm talking about it. We get about a standard deviation improvement on some particularly difficult and authentic uh, kinds of uh, problems. This is for a fourth year uh, physics course. Um, now, at Stanford, just over the last couple of years, there's been a bunch of faculty that I've been working with uh, have transformed a whole, the whole, most of the series of courses taken by physics majors, you know, in their second to fourth year. And there's some kind of other interesting effects that have been observed here. Uh, the one thing that the, everybody noticed the most, had a big impression on people, is the attendance in these courses suddenly went way up, up over what the normal attendance for advanced physics courses at Stanford is. Um, and, and we collected anonymous feedback on the teaching methods. And in fact, uh, it's been overwhelmingly positive with most of the students sort of advocating, hey, we sh how come there are some physics courses that aren't taught this way and arguing against it, okay? Um, now, but there's another important thing to think about, particularly if you're an administrator, department chair, is that all the faculty who made these changes, they have 
greatly preferred teaching this way. So they all say they had been lecturing these courses before change. They're never, none of them would consider going back now. And in fact, that's a typical response for the now 250 plus faculty that through these programs I ran at University of British Columbia in Colorado, widespread change in teaching, that's very typical for the faculty uh, across the board, that they just find teaching this way so a much more rewarding experience. Um, and so that brings you me to the institutional change part of my talk. If there's something that proves the learning and the faculty, once they develop the, exp the necessary expertise to do it, really want to do it this way, how come it's not in you know, every classroom in every university and college in the country? And so uh, just in passing, I'll say, in what we found from our program is it takes you know, roughly with support of a faculty member about 50 hours of training to become you know, respectably expert in teaching this way. So not enormous, but not trivial either. So, you know, this was the question I sort of faced almost 15 years ago, about how to make this the norm, and could we do a large-scale experiment on institutional change? Could you change how entire departments teach? So, uh, you know, that's, that's really, this, this part of the talk is kind of targeted towards the administrator level here about what universities and departments can do to actually bring about uh, widespread adoption of these things. Uh, in this scale, this experiment, we've changed now the teaching of 250, or now it's getting up close to 300, that's getting a little outdated, and you know, some 200,000 credit hours. Um, dramatically changed how these courses and, and, and faculty uh, were teaching here to adopt these more effective uh, research-based methods. And, and so, you know, the book talks in great detail about what the factors are that make this happen, what things get in the barriers, and so on. So it's sort of advice for all those things that uh, you can learn. But I'll just, you know, mention the top three challenges to this. The first is, Teaching is not rec recognized as expertise. And so, you know, what I mean by that is we have a situation that's kind of, you know, like medicine was in the late 1800s or middle 1800s, where you had, you know, for the previous 5,000 years, it was kind of a folk art, you know? You, you just declared yourself a doctor and you announced your chants were better than somebody else's or, you know, your, your evil smelling stuff uh, was, was better. Uh, and that made you a doctor and that was the, the state of the art. And then you had scientific medicine coming along where, you know, there's all this research talking about vaccinations and the immune system and germs. And, and knowing that gave you a completely different perspective and much more meaningful perspective on how to do medical treatments, but you know, there's a pretty substantial period of a few decades where, where the doctors and the state of, of understanding of medicine were quite disconnected. And I would argue that's what we have now in teaching, basically. It's, you know, faculty are using going by tradition and superstition, not the, the best research. And so for, for students, it, you know, I'll, I'll let any students in the audience know that, you know, what you should think of the next time you walk into a lecture is you're getting the pedagogical equivalent of bloodletting, okay? So, <laughs> um, so closely connected to that is the incentive system. That basically, uh, the incentive system at these universities and an overwhelming number of research universities, it, it really, you know, it's all based on research productivity, and so it actually, it very literally penalizes anybody who takes any more than the minimal amount of time required for teaching uh, to do it, because that will reduce their, uh, their research productivity. And at the core of that fault is really the fact we do not have meaningful evaluations of teaching. And so, so you know, the only way that system can change is when people start having some meaningful way of evaluating teaching. And then finally, 
what I discovered was that the organizational uh, structure of departments makes a tremendous difference and how well that's set up is whether how well they can carry through any serious innovation and change. Um, so I wanted to, to say a little more about this because I think this is an absolutely necessary step that every university has to go, has to do is start doing a better job of evaluating teaching. And I don't want to take your time tonight to go into all the details of this. I've written a paper uh, that really I think is a reasonable analysis of this, of what the requirements are for a meaningful evaluation system, showing how basically the methods that everybody uses now, student course evaluations, really fail badly at, at doing these things. And then we have a better uh, method that gives a much more detailed, useful uh, characterization of the teaching practices used and the extent to which people are using methods that uh, that research shows lead to better uh, learning outcomes. So, but you can go read about that. Uh, just so there's plenty of time for questions and discussion, I want to finish up by just giving you one final note about some learning research that you can use tomorrow. Because I really, where I give these talks, and I have a strong suspicion that most of the audience and the faculty, they, oh, that's pretty interesting, but now I got to go prepare my lecture for tomorrow. So I'm going to give you. Something you can take away where the learning science gives you a totally, you know, result which uh, is completely non-intuitive. And frankly, that's what I love about scientific research in general. Is when you carry out research and it shows, gee, the world doesn't work anything like you thought, uh, but now suddenly you you know better and understand things better. So. This starts with okay, looking at what's the absolute standard. A teaching approach where you know faculty come in and they give the students the, the formalism and definition, the equations, solution procedures and stuff. And then they move on to show them how they can use all that stuff to apply to solve various problems. Okay? And so, you know, it's hard to imagine really how you could do think about doing anything different, right? So, you know, what could possibly be wrong with this? Well, what's wrong with it is nothing if the learner came in with a brain like the instructor, with that expert brain, with all of this knowledge organization system and all this broader context, and so these things had a place to go. But, you know, they, they, it's in the, for the, for the expert, these are organized under, you know, different kinds of tools you use for solving uh, different kinds of problems with criteria for when they get used and so on. But in the vast majority of your courses, the students are novices in the field. They don't have that structure. And so they get these things coming in as really just completely disconnected facts that they don't see the purpose of, they don't see their relationship for, and they don't have any criteria for using them, and they're not linked to you know, solving problems. And so this has a bunch of bad things about it. Um, you know, first. They're, they're not linked to where they're going to be used. And the fact that they're all a bunch of separate things, it turns out the part of the brain that, or the aspect of the brain that sort of pays attention to and can remember and learn things on short time scales, so-called working memory, has this very limited capacity. And so this puts all these separate things here uh, puts a great deal more demand on the working memory and essentially leaves a whole lot less brain available for actually thinking and learning ab about the subject. Okay, So this is a very general uh, feature of, of basic thinking. And then finally, there's no motivation here because they don't know what this, why this stuff is good for anything. And so, you know, one thing research shows uh, over and over again is all three of these are critically important for, for learning and not having them is a really bad thing and will really reduce learning. So, okay, so the obvious thing isn't working, so how to do this better? So the best, better way is to start out giving a student the problem that they, you know, particular one that's meaningful, interesting to, to solve and have them try to solve it. Now, you know, of course they can't do it. They don't know enough. 
But if you structure the problem correctly, they will be able to engage in trying to see it. And most importantly, they'll, they'll be able to notice, if you've done it right, the key features of the context of the problem and features of the problem. And so that actually gives them a, a basic organizational structure for the knowledge that you can then give later, that they, they just ident just recognizing particular things are important, uh, like an expert would, is a, is a key step there. And so that really prepares them to learn so that then when you give them these tools and formalism, they can, they've got a place to put them, it's more motivating, it gives them an organizational structure and the, and the links, which reduces the, the cognitive demands, and so you get more learning that way. And so if you don't believe me, there's this classic paper by Dan Schwartz and John Bransford, who's now here, um, and on this time for telling. And what they showed in there is, you know, having people be told a bunch of, you know, learners told a bunch of stuff and then go off and try and solve problems with and then apply it to solving problems versus having them try and solve the problem and then telling them the same thing give a better factor of 10 difference in learning in those cases. So this idea of preparing the learners to learn from telling is a, is a critically important aspect. So that's something all of you can use tomorrow and if you're a student you can complain if they're doing it the wrong way. So just to, to wrap up and have some time to questions and discussion, argument that really the goal is, is having them not to memorize information, but really learn to make decisions. And this research is giving us really new insights uh, on how to do that in a much better way and really establishing real expertise around effective teaching. Um, and it makes everybody happier. So um, I, I'll, you know, want to make sure my slides will be available if you can get all these. These are some of my favorite references, these books down here. Um, and at this website, we have a whole bunch of short, you know, one and two page guides for instructors on implementing very specific aspects of these, uh, these things I've talked about in different classroom settings. And then finally, since this is uh, the, to be blunt, math has really lagged in this area of figuring out better ways to teach and measuring it. But they're catching up since this is an applied math uh, colloquium. There's a nice guide here that's just come out from the uh, MAA. So that's uh, going to be a big step forward, I think, for helping uh, math faculty adopt uh, better uh, methods as well. So thank you for your attention. So if you have questions, uh, you just have to shout them out and I'll repeat them so the video can hear them. And I will make the request, because uh, I've given a few talks like this, keep the questions short. Let's, I, I am the only one who's supposed to give the lecture. So anyway, <laughs> uh, yes. Well, I think I might quite mention this, but why is this, why does it in the Remember, I predicted to Bernard, I get a question of why do you give this a lecture format? So I, I, th th there's several reasons, actually. I mean, one is, to, uh, is just practicalities. When you're giving a one-time lecture to a group of people, you have no, you know, all the stuff I was talking about, you got to know something about your audience to really make it work, you know. Otherwise, it just doesn't help. And there's a lot of overhead. So, so there's no real alternative to that. On the other hand, I also note this is very much targeted to, to teachers, university level teachers in, in science and engineering. They bring in a lot of expertise in the subject already. And so for, for those folks who do have that background expertise, I know that they actually can learn a reasonable amount from this. And then the third and kind of most compelling, uh, strongest argument is, is to be honest, this is much more a sermon than a lecture. And so, you know, I don't, I, I don't really expect a lot of people to learn an enormous amount, but I hope they get inspired to go off and learn about it. Look at my talk, you know, 
go look at my notes, look at the references, and that serves as inspiration. Okay. Uh, yes, the white hair and black. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, just to make sure everybody here, she's asking about what's important about the organize, you know, how do different people organize information and giving me examples of different ways students really organize, really based around ways to memorize information, okay? And so, uh, and, you know, that's all they know how to do if. The, and, and the job of the instructors is to actually give them different ways to organize. So, so I look a lot, and, and others, about how experts organize information in their discipline, okay? And so, so the right way to do it, and, and this is what you have the learners think about and work through the organizational systems, is how a bunch of pieces of different information, for example, can be seen as different manifestations of the same concept. And so you'll have them go through and, and have them identify that, oh yeah, there's a lot of surface features that are different here, but there's some important underlying features that really determine the behavior and coming to practice recognizing those sort of underlying features or concepts in, in the information. And then associated with that, you have you have sets of concepts, you build this up to realizing they have sets of concepts, some of which can apply in the same situation and some are quite different. And what are the different criteria between when those concepts will apply in any, in any particular context? And so then that's, that's developing these patterns of recognizing the features of a context that are important. So that's a simple, you know, but if I want to get, I could get really complicated. We've been studying this a lot. So anyway, but that gives you a starting point of look how experts think about how to organize things. And of course, all these are organized about looking at the problem and thinking what kinds of approaches are going to be the most effective for solving this kind of problem. And that means identifying what's important, what defines that kind, okay? Uh, way in back, yeah. You're pretty far back, I guess. If nobody else yells, go ahead. Uh, uh, and so I'm, I'm going to feel kind of a juxtaposition of engineering and physics. Yeah. And so we have a, a lot of graduate students coming into the physics background, and I think there's a really important debate in the country between the physics and engineering background. How do we get bridges for? Yeah, so she's talking about the differences between physics and engineering and sort of how to bridge those. And so, uh, I can't give you, you know, any clear research-based uh, response to that. What I can do is a, an ongoing project that we just started a few months ago with a big grant from Howard Hughes, is we've been looking at the nature of expertise and extra expert problem solving across sciences and engineering and medicine. We've seen there's a remarkable level of similarity, actually, but it gets lost within the disciplinary details. And so I'm sure that there will be a way to help people understand that, oh, this is just an organizational knowledge situation. See, you're, for this field, this is the way it's done in that field, and so how can I integrate those together? Uh, but I don't know of any, any research that can tell you, oh, read this paper and I'll tell you how to do it. Uh, yeah, here. Uh, you know, you don't, uh, so he's asking how much training, you know, before you can start introducing some of these techniques. Uh, you don't need any training at all uh, to have them not, to have them work is another issue, okay? So that depends, you know, 
that depends enormously on how much previous experience and thought any individual instructor can have. I'm just taking, uh, what I'm looking at is we had a pretty, you know, you can go read the book and see, we had a pretty substantial support system for faculty, but within that system we saw that the the norm, the you know, there were some who, who were, you know, could almost immediately be quite good, others were, struggled even at the very end. It really had a lot to do with how empath how much they could think like students <laughs> and understand. But in any case, a pretty typical number was after about 50 hours, people had been through one transformation, one course, and they'd had it down pretty effectively. And then they'd go on to do other courses that would work quite well and, and get good results. So what about over on that side? Yeah. Yeah, so he's asking about the incentive system for teaching. And, you know, what I would say is you don't need great incentives. You just need some in meaningful incentives. Because right now we have, you know, we have at Research University a very elaborate process. And I would argue pretty darn accurate, not perfect, but at actually evaluating somebody's research productivity. And we've got nothing for teaching. And so, uh, you know, I, I think the essential step is to start capturing real expertise in teaching. And, and you start with collecting data on what are the teaching methods that they're actually using across, you know, in all their classes, which isn't being done currently, but is easy to do. And then you start looking at, okay, how much are they using research-based practices? That's going to put you a long ways from where you are now. You know, now you could ultimately go to external reviews and all kinds of stuff like, like you have with, uh, with research. But I don't think we need to do that. I think just any meaningful, you know, a meaningful evaluation team where it starts to count something, okay? It's not just, you know, if it's a small positive number, what we've seen is people like to teach this way. You just have to make it not such a negative for them to take the time to learn. Okay. Uh, yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so first at the college level, you know, it's clearly having some effect, but since no university collects any data on what's actually being done, you know, all you can believe is they'll tell you they care about teaching, but that's like, you know, that's like saying, well, you can go to this hospital, they really care about patients, but a lot of them are just using bloodletting, we never actually check, uh, or, or, you know, to be more real, actually, not quite so facetious. I mean, even after all this time where, you know, it's overwhelming shown that it is really important that doctors wash their hands between patients, okay? It turns out that if you don't actually measure if doctors are washing their hands, they still only do it about 15 or 20 percent of the time. If you measure what they're actually doing, and do it at 80 plus percent of the time. And so, you know, it just says, look, you got to start measuring. Uh, but, and, and until we do, I can't answer that question. Nobody can answer that question. It's just, it is clear that the lectures are still overwhelmingly pervasive and the evaluation system is never telling you any, anything. Uh, with the high school level, uh, or, and even below, it's a, it's a tricky business because uh, there's very few people who actually look at the state of education. And there's a whole bunch of people who do research in K-12. A whole bunch of people, or smaller numbers, do research in the university level. You'll never get data from K-12 like I showed here. Uh, and it's basically because the research is just so much harder. There's so many more confounding variables uh, in what happens there. But the, one of the probably the biggest confounding variable is the subject mastery of the teachers. You know, 
So I was talking about there, you have to know what, you know, thinking like a physicist is like. Uh, and, you know, there are exceptions, but in the great majority of cases, the, the teachers just don't have the subject mastery uh, required. And, you know, we see that, we see some effects, even at the, at the university level of, you know, you, you can get by with far less understanding the subject if you're going to be a talking textbook than if you're going to teach uh, in this way. So I see that as really, you know, uh, a big challenge there. But it's one that's really, it's the university's fault. You know, we have to do a much better job of educating those teachers in the subject. And UW here has developed some special programs in physics for that. But most teacher training programs don't have it at all. And so uh, that's just, we got to fix it. And then we can expect to have a lot bigger impact to low levels. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So you're you're absolutely right. It's quite limited, uh, or not enormously limited. We have data from other places, uh, and it does show quite similar patterns where it can break down, uh, or where you see similar differences is when people try and take some exact thing from, say, University of Washington that developed a lot of these and go and put them into an environment where the students have much less preparation, and then it's just a mismatch, okay? And so, and so I, I would argue that, that when people don't have that mismatch in student preparation, they seem to work much the same. Uh, when there is a big mismatch, and some cases I know of where people are working with very poorly prepared students, they've made adaptations that have then produced very large, in some cases, really much larger results, because you're sort of starting at a, at a, you know, a lower level. But the extent of the research on that, and particularly at community colleges and second language you know, learners and so on, uh, you know, that is, that's just a, a gap in the research, uh, you know, in the research that's, that's, that we have. And uh, it's something that needs to be done. And people are starting to work on it. But there's lots to be done there. Let's see. How about someone over there? Yeah, yeah. Way in the back corner. I tried for geographical diversity here. As long as you can talk really loud. Uh, you know, we're doing, <laughs> depends on what you say you're trying. I mean, if you set up and you have, you know, something like we did there with some professor who students say was great. He was really experienced. He was sure he was wonderful. We had another class that was teaching a different way. We get in the same test. I mean, I don't see any bias in the, in the measures. The only place where you see a difference is in the outcome.